there's also this through line of anti-white racism as a justification. I mean, it's been around since forever, I'm sure, the, or the civil rights era more uh, uh, recently. But it's popular. It's also something that creates a sort of divisiveness in whites today. How do you become an anti-racist in that context? I, I think part of the sort of preponderance, especially in recent decades of this notion of reverse discrimination as it was mm -hmm. called before and now more anti-white racism, such that a few years ago, the majority of white Americans stated that white people were more likely to be discriminated against than any other group. I think that stems from how people are conceiving of and defining a racist policy. So typically Americans of all races tend to define a policy as racist or even discriminatory based on whether it has racial language in the policy or based on the intent of the policymaker, not the outcome. Mm. And so if we were to define racist policies as racist by their outcome, what we would then see is the outcome of all of these, of many of these policies are white people being on the higher end of those outcomes. But again, if, we are, if we're determining by the actual policy itself, and that then allows a white American to say, well, you know, isn't, for instance, affirmative action anti-white? And then that would cause people like me to say, well, isn't a standardized test um, mm. set of policies anti-black? Because the, the outcome, it's leading to racial disparities where white people are on the higher end. And so I think that one of the things that all Americans need to realize is that we should be defining policies as racist based on their outcome. And yet, this is what the capitalists of today are funding. This is where the capitalists of today are putting their money. They're putting their money towards the absolute destruction of the system that makes their wealth possible. The absolute destruction of the system that they have benefited from. The absolute destruction of the system that has created the modern world. And why do they do it? Why do they do it? I mean, to some extent they do it out of what? To, to, buy, to buy the people's love. To, to um, what do they call it? Virtue signal, they say. But what is the morality that they are signaling? And do you really think all it is, is signaling? The morality they're signaling is the morality of altruism. A morality that they are bought into. It's not just a morality. Oh, let's just do this. Get that sun out of my eyes. It's not just a morality that other people have. And I'm going to appease those other people is a morality that tragically the business them themselves have bought into, have embraced, and therefore feel guilty. All right, so the big news of the day from my perspective, I know there were a lot of other things going on, the Democratic National Convention, boring, uh, and, and, and a bunch of other political news, all boring, much more important, much more interesting, much more fundamental to the future of this country is uh, this story, uh, which I saw on Twitter. Twitter, the great uh, facilitator of good news stories. And that is the story that Steve, uh, that Jack Dorsey, and Jack Dorsey, uh, an, an amazing entrepreneur, one of the great entrepreneurs of the last 20 years, uh, the founder not only of Twitter, which you could argue its value, you know, <laughs> somebody who uses Twitter a lot, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's an incredible platform, an incredible value. I mean, look at how everybody uses it, including the president of the United States, but uh, also the founder of Square. Square is a, is a fantastic product, a payment system. Uh, I, I used to have a Square. You attach it to your iPhone. You can, you can take credit card, credit card a payment with a Square. It's just a great product uh, and a great company. Uh, he's actually the CEO, I think, of both companies or has been the CEO of both companies, um, but just a, a, a real Silicon Valley entrepreneur with a reported net worth of about $5 billion. And uh, somebody who has, uh, 
He's uh, established a, a charitable fund. He's committed to giving away, hard to tell, but it looks like that like $3 billion. He's actually, there's actually a Google Doc. You can go to Google Doc. And the Google Doc actually will list every contribution that Jack Dorsey has made. The amount, who the organization is, with some notes attached to it. So there is literally a Google Doc with all of that information uh, available. And it looks like the goal from what the Google Doc says, the goal is to give away $3 billion. I'm really not sure uh, what he's going to do with the other $2 billion. I mean, you know, I, I, I think he should feel pretty guilty of having the other $2 billion and give them away too. But what's he going to give it to his kids? Does he even have kids? I mean, what's he going to do with, uh, with all that money? Uh, you know, it's really, 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 really hard to tell. Anyway, uh, among the many contributions that, that Jack Dorsey has done in the center is he's given money to Black Lives Matter. Uh, you know, you go through the list. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of um, COVID nineteen uh, uh, contributions, and then there's huge numbers of um, of all kinds of really radical leftist organizations. Um, including Black Lives Matter and a bunch of other spinoffs like Black Lives Matter, the just the Center for, De for Democracy, and a bunch of these that are just radically leftist uh, institutions that Jack Dorsey gives money to. But what, what really uh, struck uh, to me is that he gave $10 million, which as far as I could tell just looking through the list, looked like the largest gift he's ever given. $10 million is a lot of money for a non-for-profit. The $10 million has been given to the Center for Anti-Racist Research. Now, you know, just without knowing more about the topic and about who these people are, I mean, okay, I can see $10 million to fight racism. That seems like a, it seems like a good cause. I'm not opposed to that. I mean, I'm anti-racism in the proper sense, not in the sense it's being used here. I oppose racism. I, I, I fight for race, if I, against racism, uh, as you know, because uh, there's a bunch of racists on my chat, usually, who I fight against among uh, the various people that I fight with uh, on the issue of racism, put up videos against racism and so on. So maybe, maybe this is such a bad cause until you realize that the center is run by, uh, it was launched, it was created really for uh, what's called a leading scholar, leading scholar. The leading scholar is uh, Ibram X. Kendi. Ibram X. Kendi. And if you know something about Ibram X. Kendi, then you start to be afraid and you start to worry for how this uh, money is going to use. Klonwald says that what I said sounds like something uh, sounds like something a racist would say. That's what the anti-racist said. That's what Ibram X. Kendi or the white fragility woman would say, like, right, if you declare, no, no, I'm not a racist. I fight racism. I, I, I do shows against racism. Then you're being defensive and it just means you're really a racist. And that's, that's, that's exactly what they all say, right? That's what exactly what they say. You don't understand what, what it really means to be an anti-racist. Now, I did a whole show on what it means to be an anti-racist. So you refer to that. We're going to resurrect some of those core issues. We're going to talk a little bit about what it means, not a little bit, quite a bit, about what it means to be an anti-racist and why uh, it is so abhorrent, and in particular, why Ibram X. Kendi, just let's drop the X, Ibram Kendi is such an evil representative of uh, this ideology. The whole ideology is evil, and he's particularly bad. I mean, he's particularly nasty, and, and we will talk about it. And as you dig more, into um, what Kendi stands for, the abhorrent nature of this gift by Jack Dorsey becomes apparent. Now, let's be clear. Um, Jack Dorsey can do whatever the hell he wants with his money. It's his money. He can give it to whoever he wants. He can burn it. He can, uh, he can uh, you know, he could support the Iran Brooks show. I mean, $10 million would go a long way to supporting the Iran Brooks show forever. And I'd stop bugging you about doing Super Chat because... Right now, you know, nobody's doing any super chats. What's up with that? This is like the longest we've gone ever without a super chat. Um, 
yeah, if I got the $10 million from Jack Dorsey, you know, I'd, I'd stop bugging you about Super Chats. We could actually just do just do shows, right? Um, although maybe then I'd be detached from my viewers and I my customers, I'd, and then I, I, I'd slack off because I wouldn't need the money and I wouldn't have to perform. This way I have to perform to get your money, like song and dance, something like that. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Don't lie. All right, I wouldn't. I think I think you're you're talking to me. I wouldn't stop bugging you. That's ridiculous. Absolutely. All right. So um, let's talk about uh, first. I, I want to uh, just a little logistics. What is the center? A center. It's a, it's a center for, um, you know, for research. It's at a university, right? It's the center for anti-racist research. It's at a university. It's at Boston University. Uh, Ibram was brought into you, Boston University. He was hired in June to run the center. That was why he was hired. Uh, we'll get into his biography in a little bit. You know, he's a pretty famous, well-known guy. Uh, he is the founding director, the spirit behind this. The, the whole program of the center is to do research on policy proposals that would solve the problem of racism that would be anti-racist. So the whole point is to not just do academic research. No, this is an academic institution, which purposes, right? the purpose is to actually make proposals about how to do policy, how to change our policies so that they become anti-racist policies. Because according to, according to Ibrahim, it's not individuals who are racist. The problem is not individual racist. Some individuals are racist, but that's not the problem. And this he shares the whole idea of white fragility. Racism is systemic. Racism is part of society. Racism is in every policy that we have. Racism is and every aspect of our lives. Racism is everywhere. And unless we change the fundamental nature, the fundamental policies that guide our lives, we will never get rid of, we will never get rid of racism. Uh, Okay, we're going to try this uh, copy-paste of these uh, questions. Uh, this might be too much for my operating system, but we'll see. All right. So, Jack Dorsey, the, the entrepreneur, businessman, is given money, $10 million, not a trivial, not a trivial amount, a non-trivial amount, to, um, to Kendi. So, let's, let's talk a little bit about who Kendi is. So, very well known, very very well known. Um, in 2016, he became the youngest person ever to win the National Book Award for nonfiction. Um, he he wrote a bestseller, stamped from the beginning, the definitive history of racist ideas. Right. Uh, from that point on, he's an he is, he's an academic historian. So he became a kind of activist slash historian. Um, in, in this in this book, he, he condensed 600 years of racial history into 500 pages. I, you know, I don't know what that. I've, I haven't seen really a good summary of what that book is about. But what he's really well known for, really well known for, is his book "How to Be an Anti-Racist." How to be an anti-racist. This book came out in uh, 2019. It became a bestseller. It is it is a huge. He, he, the whole anti-racist concept, the whole anti-racist movement, the whole idea really was popularized by this book and became a big deal culturally. He, he is now 38 years old. He's a Guggenheim fellow. He's a contributor writer for the Atlantic. He is obviously the head of the center at Boston University. He is one of the most distinguished, I guess, um, activists on the whole Black Lives Matter anti-racist uh, agenda items that are out there. 
Now, what does he advocate? What is, uh, what is anti-racism? First, he, he advocates that there's no such thing as a, an idea that's not racist. All ideas, all policies, all people basically fall into two categories. All ideas, all policies, all people fall into one of two categories. You're either a racist, your policies are racist, your ideas are racist, or you're anti-racist. Being a non-racist is a cop-out. Being a non-racist is passive. And by default, that makes you a racist. By default, that makes you a racist. Whoops. So, the first thing to notice is if you say, well, I'm not a racist. Well, that is the first indication that you actually are. What you have to be is somebody who is fighting, actively fighting, against racism. And what it means to actively fight against racism is not to argue, you know, for colorblindness. It's to actively engage in pursuing policy changes that are anti-racist. You know, so every policy has a racist element to it. He, he literally says this quote from the book. Every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation is producing or sustaining either racial inequity or equity. So everything is either providing equity one way or the other. Now notice that the standard for racism is not how you treat people. The standard for racism is not, you know, kind of the definition we have used here on the show many times in terms of what racism is. That is, do you treat a person based on the color of their skin, uh, you know, versus treating them, you know, as a member of a group or as an individual. That's not his uh, use of the term racism. I'm saying I've got computer problems again, but that's, okay, we sold that. Uh, we'll get, uh, okay. I've got some super chat issues. All right, there we go. Um, no, for him, racism is about equity. And equity is just a code word. It's a moral code word. It's a moral, it's a, it's a word about morality. It's a word about justice, equity, which means equality. So any policy that might in any way lead to what he would consider inequality among the races is racist. The ideal is equality among races. So the ideal is equality of outcome. The blacks, on average, I guess, I'm not sure how you would deal with individuals, but on average, have to be equal to whites. And whites, like the Irish have to be equal to the Russians, have to be, because ethnicity is also part of this anti-racist thing. The whole driving force of anti-racism, the whole driving force of the modern left, the whole driving force, intellectual driving force, of the, of the extreme left is egalitarianism, is the idea of equality of outcome equality of outcome. And by the way, you know, they don't really address this, but I think that if they're pushed, their equality of outcome is not limited to financial outcome. It's far more expansive than that. And if you've read Equal is Unfair, my book about this whole issue of inequality and equality, then you know what I think of this and you know what this inevitably leads to. It leads to death, destruction, and, 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 and catastrophe. So the whole movement, the whole idea here, is driven by the notion of equality, some kind of equality of outcome. That's, 
That's what they're after. That's what they want. So he's asked in one of in, in, in one of his interviews, Ezra Klein asks him, Ezra Klein is also a leftist, but not quite as not quite as nutty. Ezra Klein's asked him, so let, let's take this idea that every policy is racist. So do you think that if somebody advocates for lowering the capital gains tax, is that racist? And he says, yes, most owners of stock are white. So the most of the beneficiaries are white. Lowering the capital gains taxes would exacerbate, therefore, inequality between whites and blacks. And therefore, it is a racist policy, even though the intention is not racist, because the outcome would lead to greater inequality. It is a racist policy. Now, notice how truly insane that is. But that is what these people advocate for. That's how they think about these kind of issues. And the New York Times, by the way, hailed this book how to be an anti-racist, as the most courageous book to date on the problem of race in the Western mind. So this guy is huge. Right? He blames racism for every imaginable problem in the world. Racism heightens exploitation. It causes arms races. It threatens the life of human society with nuclear war and climate change. So even climate change is now blamed on racism, which doesn't surprise me because, of course, climate change was blamed on inequality, has been blamed on inequality all along. So it doesn't surprise me that they've added, you know, say so if inequality is the essence of how racism manifests itself, then yeah. I want to show you... Um, let me just see. Yeah, I want to show you a clip of this guy. Let's see if we can find it. Yeah, there it is. How to be an anti-racist. This is uh, so. This is uh, Ibram. He's a young guy. Um, so here's a clip of him discussing uh, some of these issues around anti-racism, but in particular about anti-racism and capitalism. All right. Let's see. Hopefully this will play. If not, I'll just summarize it for you. Maybe the download speed that uh, that Cox is telling me actually exists doesn't really exist, right? Maybe that doesn't work either. All right, we're not doing that. It's not worth the effort or time. What's the relationship between anti-racism and capitalism? Well, he says capitalism is essentially racist. Racism is essentially capitalist. Capitalism and racism are basically essentially the same thing. There is no difference between the two. He says... Quote, since the dawn of racial capitalism, when were markets level playing fields? When could black people compete equally with white people? He says never. Now, that's just factually incorrect. But what is ignored here, of course, is the fundamental nature of capitalism. Now, he's an historian. So he goes back in history and he sees People got rich off of the slave trade. So that's capitalism. He says people get rich in the South. You see this all the time that they argue that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, this country was built on slaves. No, slavery actually inhibited the ability of America to become rich. Slavery is actually wealth destroying. It's actually net loss. Yes, 
the slave owners were incredibly wealthy individuals, particularly if you count the so-called value, in quotes, of the slaves. But Southern society was poor. It was dominated by poor whites and poor blacks who were slaves. But even if you just look at white society, the South was poor. One of the reasons it's lost the Civil War. It is not true that slavery allowed the South to become rich. Quite the opposite. Slavery kept the South poor. It is the North that was capitalist, that was anti-slavery, that had employees, not slaves, voluntary transactions, not coercive transactions. It was the North that was truly rich. It was the North where wealth was created. And of course, what are the two countries that abolished slavery early? Well, it was England and the United States. The United States took it longer, took it a civil war. But the North in the United States, where there was no slavery, slavery throughout the 19th century, those were the two most capitalist places on the planet. And it's not an accident that they're the ones that abolish slavery. But they ignore all this. All of that doesn't matter to them. Doesn't matter to them. Right. Capitalism is slavery. Now note that this is who Jack Dorsey is supporting. He's supporting anti-capitalist Marxist spun ideology that has replaced class with race but that seeks an egalitarian utopia in which the Jack Dorseys of the world cannot exist. Cannot exist. Why? Because they're smart. They're hardworking. They're ambitious. They've got ideas. They're not equal to anybody else. The Jack Dorseys of the world are cannot exist in such a world. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at youronbrookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals. Uh, and uh, and show your support for all for, for for the work for the value hopefully you're receiving from this and uh, and of course don't forget if you're not a subscriber even if you even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up you'll know what shows are on when they're on you'll get notified right. 
So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.